above, pretty straightforward too. Policy, policy for me includes policy, governance, and management, uh, audits, things like that, wanting a security program. People is the last one, and that includes things like security awareness training, personnel, attacker profiling, and as you can see, the, the ones on people aren't, uh, aren't as widely used. The only one on there that we come across frequently is security awareness. So how good are we at these different things? Well, physical, we've been doing physical security as long as there have been things to steal, so we're pretty good. The technical, so we've been doing technical security for quite a while too. I mean, we're not perfect. We don't have the perfect firewall, probably never will. We're always going to have technical deficiencies and we'll always be fixing them, but we're still pretty good. On the policy side, we're getting a little more shaky, but in fact, we've been doing this for a while. The, uh, the British standards, excuse me, the British standards were out a while ago, and that led to the ISO 27000 series. And for the most part, we really do understand how to run a security program. But people, I think largely as a profession, we have failed to deal with people. We don't do a good job handling the people side of the equation. And oftentimes what I hear, and you've probably heard this as well, is that people are the problem. You know, the security thing would be easy if it weren't for all these users. So, people are the problem. So there's a couple of things I have to say about this. First of all, that oftentimes it's, uh, people are stupid and you can't fix stupid. Or people should know better. People should know better than to click on, click on that link or open that attachment in their email. They should know that that's an evil attachment. And in fact, there's an article on the SANS diary, the incident handler diary called CDU0. It's pretty funny, but it basically says the user clicks on something they shouldn't and we're not going to be able to fix it. So security awareness training is my other pet peeve. And inevitably, when people do security awareness training, they say, well, let's put up posters. Even though we have no way of knowing that this does any good at all. And either that or send out emails telling everybody to do good things, pick good passwords, don't click on attachments that you don't know. Or I think one of the worst things we can do, which is say that security is everyone's business. That actually leads into the next slide. So Jeff Stanton has been, uh, he did about three years of research interviewing people in both IT and security, as well as management and non-IT people about their attitudes about security. And this is a quote from an email exchange I had with him. So what I think he's really getting at here is that IT people think, don't, don't really think much about the people they work with. They pretty much say, you know, if I beat them with a stick, you, you, get, uh, you get the right response. Um, they don't really take a creative approach in dealing with people. So rather than saying that people are the problem, my argument is that design is the problem. So if the system fails, if somebody clicks on a link that they shouldn't, well, the problem is we should never have let them click on that link in the first place. So really, it's our responsibility to make the system fail safe so that normal people can use the system without it breaking. So there's an old paper that goes back all the way to 99. This was when PGP was at the height of its popularity. Uh, the title, which some of you may have heard of, is Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. So they took 12 people in this study, 12 educated professionals. They sat them down with instructions in front of a computer and said, here you go, encrypt an email and send it to your friend. So they had to go through the key exchange, they had to sign the email, they had to encrypt the email, they had to send it. So of those 12 people, only three were successful. Even though, and they say this in the paper, that this is actually a simple product to use for those who already understand the basic models of public key cryptography and digital signature based trust, which is a little bit like saying that it's simple to use if you already know how to use it. <laughs> So I think also that our expectations for people are part of the problem. So I think that, in fact, there's a cognitive failure here. What's obvious to us 
as security experts, we've been doing this for a while, isn't necessarily obvious to everyone else. And this is a common mistake. Everybody makes this. They just kind of assume that everybody thinks like they, like they do. But training everyone to be experts isn't practical. You know, we don't have, uh, when, when we have companies and we have, we have a legal department, we don't train everybody to be a lawyer. We train them to know when they need to go to the legal department. Same thing. And really what we need to do is design our systems to account for that lack of expertise so that in, in, in many cases actually taking over the security decisions from the user because we shouldn't ask them to make a decision that they're not qualified to make. And this has actually already started to happen. If you think about antivirus, for those of us who've been working with computers for long enough, back in the 80s when antivirus first came out, what we had was, hey, you got a virus. Would you like to clean this? Yes or no? <laughs> Seemed to make sense at the time. Somebody who knew what they're doing could back out if it wasn't actually a virus and they knew that was the case. But the reality is, is that in most cases you want to click yes, and by giving people the option to click no, you're actually just letting people shoot themselves in the foot. So, as we all know, this doesn't happen anymore. Antivirus just cleans it automatically, it doesn't give you that option. Although in some cases, they might just throw it in a quarantine folder. So if something horrible happens, like a McAfee update decides to you know, eat all your office files, that you can actually recover. So. so how did we end up in a situation where we don't deal well with people? Well, this is actually, there's a good story behind this. And it's, uh, it's how our profession evolved. We started out as IT security. You know, with the first, the first security was on computers. And we have the interaction of people and computers and information. But as we evolved and decided to call ourselves information security, we haven't quite caught up to the new model, which is people interacting with information. There's no computers in that equation. Not when you're talking about information security. So that's what behavioral information security is an attempt to address. So it's not going to fix technical problems, but it is an, it's a philosophical shift that puts people first. So the idea is, by putting people first, we can build better policy, better technology, and even have better physical security by understanding the people. So this is uh, Jeff Stanton's definition of behavioral information security. He actually comes from kind of an organizational psychology uh, background, so his definition reflects that. And here's my definition. So I define behavioral information security as a formal methodology to manage risk, information risk, derived from knowledge of how humans behave and interact with information. And really what we're after, what I'm after, my goals for behavioral information security is the second part, to design better systems that take people into account, and a human interface design for InfoSec, if you will. So why, why should we care? Why behavioral information security? Well, I think there's a few reasons to care about it. First is that it can develop new tools to address the people problem that we don't have today. And also, I think it can help modernize the profession. I don't know if anybody here has read The New School, but The New School kind of touches on a lot of these same kind of issues, I think. But the bottom line really is this. To reduce the cost and increase the effectiveness of information security. And if we can't do that, then we're not doing our jobs. I mean, the, I, that we exist to support our businesses, and it's our job to make sure that the security we deliver is cost efficient and effective. Or, to paraphrase Vader, <laughs> so, behavioral security modeling. So, any questions before we go on? Okay, great. So, behavioral security modeling is really primarily a method rather than a model uh, for describing security requirements using these ideas of behavioral information security. So, this should look familiar. 
How many times have you come across this? Notice that it's bolt control. So here's the, here's the scenario. I just set up a new folder and I want to give everyone access. Well, what do I mean when I say everyone? Do I mean everybody on my team? Everybody in IT? Or do I mean everybody who is able to access this directory even if they're anonymous? Well, my guess is, is that I probably don't mean that last thing on there, but that's exactly what happens when you set this up on Windows. So, this, this problem, this, this example points out a couple of things. Right? So we have the everyone problem. There's two aspects to this. First of all, that what do we mean by everyone? And there's a gap between what I wanted and what I actually got. So the desired outcome actually is, when I said everyone, I mean I want to authorize all IT employees and contractors to view or read the contents of my folder. What I actually got, in fact, was everybody with an account on the system. Now, in fact, you can include people who don't have accounts on the system, but the truth is on most Windows systems these days, you have to have an account to get to a shared folder. So we're introducing a vulnerability here because the difference between what I wanted and what I actually got are not the same. That, that creates a vulnerability. The vulnerability in this case is that people that I did not authorize to have access to the system, or did not intend to authorize to have access to the system, now do. So, behavioral security modeling is a standard methodology for describing these desired or intended outcomes. It's useful to describe user intent, which is very important. It's useful to describe system functionality, so you can use this same technique to describe what's actually there. And this allows us to analyze and identify gaps between what was desired and what we've actually built, which, as I said, introduced vulnerabilities. So, ultimately what we're working towards with behavior security modeling is improving the precision of our security requirements so that we don't introduce the vulnerabilities in the first place. If we can deliver on the security that people are actually asking for, then we'll have more secure systems. So there's a few components of the modeling process. We have actors. Actors are always people. We're not allowed to put systems in an actor role. It's because systems don't operate on their own. People are always behind that the intent flows from the people who set up the system, not from the system itself. Until we have AI, actors will always be. So, actors could be individuals. This could be people in a certain role, like it could be an accountant. It could be specific people. It could be Bob from accounting. It could be groups, and these groups are always social groups that exist within the context of the organization that you're talking about. So they're not just arbitrary collections of people, because when you talk to people, business people, real people who need to do work, they don't think in terms of abstract groupings of people, they think of terms of people I'm working with on my project, or people that are in my department, or something like that. So we have objects. Objects is information. This is usually held in an information system, so this is what's in the computers. We have actions, we have both functional actions, which are simple actions, which basically amounts to read and write, and ultimately that's what we're boiling down to. We have complex actions, these are kind of business-driven activities, so I purchase a book, I create an account on the system, or something like that. And finally, on the actions, security actions, now these are specialized actions that are really relevant to security and have a specific security impact. So things like identify, I want to identify who you are, or authenticate, so prove to me you are who you say you are. Authorize, so I'm going to say, give somebody permission to do something, to perform an action. Or delegate, which is a more complicated idea. So we also have this important idea of constraints. So constraints are limitations on actions. So you're not going to blanket authorize somebody to read necessarily. You're going to actually put constraints on that. And that could be time, so you're only allowed to do it <clears throat> excuse me, during business hours. Or it could be location, like I'm only going to allow you to do it while you're in the office. 
Now, an important concept in addition to constraints is this idea of hidden constraints. Because when you're talking to people, they will probably not tell you a lot of the things that they want you to put on constraints. So these are implied, assumed, or otherwise unstated constraints. So when I say give access to Bob in accounting, I probably don't mean forever. I probably mean only as long as he's working here and as long as it's appropriate for, it, for his job. But people don't think to say those things because they just kind of assume that magically happens. Now, the good news is, as long as he's working here, most companies have figured that out and now take care of that behind the scenes. But the second thing doesn't happen as, it doesn't happen as much, and it's still a problem today for many companies. So let's, let's actually use this approach in a lightweight manner to look at a, specific, a couple of specific examples. So the first scenario is SharePoint. I want everyone to have access to my SharePoint site. Okay, sounds great. How do we model this out? So I'm the first actor. I'm the site owner. Uh, the actor, in this case, the other actor is all employees and contractors. Now we've actually had a conversation to figure it out. When I say everyone, I mean all employees and contractors. It's everybody working for the company. The security action here is authorized. I'm authorizing a functional action to happen. The functional action is read. The object is my SharePoint site. And the constraints are I only want this at work. This is because we actually have two sites, two SharePoint sites, one internal and one external. And I want this to be on the internal site. And there's a hidden constraint here as well that I probably don't specifically call out, which is this is only for current employees and contractors. If they leave the company, I don't want them to have access anymore. So how do I set this up? So SharePoint has this great feature. Hey, there's this authenticated users group. That sounds like everybody in the company. Why don't I just use that? So there's a problem here. Who, who is in authenticated users? It's actually more than just all employees and contractors. It includes anybody with a login to the system. So that, that could be vendors, you know, just random, you know, random contractors who really are you know, just kind of specialized contractors who don't take place in kind of the normal day-to-day -day activity that I'm thinking of. So there's a possible fix for this. Instead of SharePoint presenting me the option of go find a group or just use authenticated users, want to actually present a list of socially relevant groups for me to choose from. So instead, I say, hey, what, what group would you like to be able to view your site? And I can pick from this list and pick the one that's most appropriate for my situation. Now, the last one is interesting. All employees, contractors, vendors, and partners. That's really what I'm saying when I'm saying authenticated users. Now, do I really want that? Maybe, maybe not. And in fact, as an organization, we might decide that that's too risky for people to use, so we're not going to let them do that. We're actually going to take that off the list. We're going to have a policy that says you're not allowed to grant that because there aren't really any normal circumstances where that would be appropriate. So SharePoint, again, because I love to pick on SharePoint. Uh, it's a great tool with fantastic security that really gets is very well managed in most cases. That's, I've never seen a poorly managed security in SharePoint. So Alice, um, she works with Bob. Um, Alice is a marketing employee that I'm working with on a 6-1 project, and she requests access to my site. Pretty common scenario. So I actually want to grant Alice access. So how does that break down in terms of the modeling? Well, I'm, I'm the actor. I'm the site owner. Alice is the other actor. So in this case, I'm actually thinking about Alice specifically because it's not unique to her role. She just happens to be working on my project. The security action, again, is authorized. I'm authorizing her to read my SharePoint site. Again, this is our internal SharePoint site, so we're restricting it to that. And here's the hidden constraints, which are important. What I don't say, but what I probably mean is, I really only want to grant Alice access for the duration of this project, and only if Alice is still in her current job, and only if she's employed at the company. So, what actually happens? Well, 
SharePoint sends me an email. Very helpful, very helpful that way. It says here, click on this link to grant Alice access. So I do. There's a problem. There's no time limit. I don't think about that and I never take her access away. So there is a possible solution to this as well. I would love if Microsoft could actually implement these things, by the way. I think it would make it a much more, much more effective product. I actually asked for a time limit. So the system asked me how long should Alice have access to your site? For some number of months, right? Indefinitely, as long as she's in her current position, or indefinitely, as long as she's here at the company. And again, the last two may or may not be appropriate for your organization. You know, we might actually say, you know, the last one, no, it, you know, if she changes positions, she's got to get new access, so if she changes positions, the access automatically goes away. One of the nice things is if you actually eliminate those last two options organizationally, you've done something clever. You've actually forced people into doing periodic reviews of SharePoint access. Because if I can only grant people access for a limited period of time, that means after 12 months, they have to renew their access somehow. Hopefully, the system will actually send you a friendly reminder saying, hey, this person's access is about to expire. Would you like to extend their access? I say yes, and they says for how long, and I say 12 more months. A little bit of extra work, but it forces those reviews to happen. Again, building a system with people in mind so that it becomes easy for them to do security. So, let's get into the meat of the talk. Let's talk about something that I have a lot of love for, that's credit cards. Credit cards definitely designed with security in mind and definitely designed with the internet in mind. Clearly, because we have no issues with credit card payments today. So, credit card payments. We have, we have three people involved in the transaction, at least as far as we're going to talk about today. There's really a few more, but we're going to only focus on these three. There's the customer, the merchant, and the processor, the one that makes money happen. So there's a lot of people behind the processor where we're going to skip them. And really, we're going to focus on the merchant. So, so here's the, the customer story. The customer wants to buy something. The customer wants to buy an iPod Nano and says, here, I'm going to authorize you, merchant, to take $149 from my account. In return, you give me an iPod Nano. So they actually provide an, auth an authorization token. This is the card number, expiration date, and all the other good things that they need to make the card work. So, what is an authorization token? So, this is a little bit of a detour. So, this is something else that's important for modeling. Security tokens, as I am using them here, are bundles of information that actually are representative of what you're trying to do. So, the, the token has all the data needed to carry out the security action within the computer system. So, for example, in this case, we have an authentication token. The authentication token has everything you need, excuse me, authorization token. The authorization token has everything you need to authorize payment on that credit card. You could have an identification token. The username is a great example of this. You could have an authentication token. Where you could actually you could have a password, or you could actually have a hard token, yet another use of the word token, like an RSA token, same word. So what does the customer model look like? So who are the actors? Anyone? Well, the individual. The individual, the customer, yes. Who's the other actor? Merchant. Merchant. Okay. What's the security action? Physical card. What's that? Physical card. Physical card. Now what's the security action? What are we trying to oh, do? Oh, transaction. Authorized. I heard that. That's correct. Okay. What's the functional action? You have the purchase, receiving the payment, exactly. And the object, what are we operating on? So it's this is kind of a trick question. There's really two, I have put one of them up here. One is the customer account, and, and really one is the merchant account. <coughs> oh, sorry. So for those of you who have fast eyes, you saw the answer. So what are the constraints here? This is actually an important point. The dollar figure, $149. The dollar figure, you got it. What else? The item. 
Sorry? The item or service. The okay. item, yeah, that's that's part of it. So the, the item should only be exchanged if that money is authorized to be taken out. Yeah, so who did I who did I authorize though? Ah. The person, right. The person here. So this is $149 for one transaction only between the customer and the merchant. So again, these, these are hard. So I'm, I'm dropping the whole idea of hidden constraints here, just assuming we figure those all out. That's part of the challenge. Figuring out what are the assumptions built into the constraints of that model. So what are the constraints? That is probably the trickiest part of doing this correctly, I think. So, and we have a token. Token is the card number and the rest of the authorization data. So. So we have a merchant. Their story is similar. They receive the authorization token. They delegate the transfer of $149. And they store the card number as identification token, you know, for marketing purposes, so they can serve the customer better. No other reason. And finally, they provide that authorization token to the processor and, of course, send the, send the product on to the customer. So how do we model that out? So, there's actually, so actually, before we go forward, there's actually two things happening here. First is that the merchant is delegating the transfer of the money. And the second thing is, separate action, they're actually storing that card number. So they're, they're doing two things. You, you, know, you get one transaction from the customer, you get two, you can get two from the merchant. So the first thing is the delegation of the payment. So who are the actors? First actor. Anyone? Merchant. Merchant. Second actor. Processor. Processor. What's the security action? You just said it. Delegate. Delegate. What's the functional action? Uh, Authorized user. Authorized token. Transfer the money. You got it. And the objects, obviously, the customer and the merchant accounts. And what are the constraints? Have they changed? No, they haven't changed. They're still the same. We have. $149, one transaction only between the customer and the merchant. And finally, the token, same token that we passed from the customer to the merchant. So, save, save you all some time and agony. We'll just go ahead and look at, the, look at the second thing the merchant is doing. The merchant is identifying the customer. Uh, they're storing an object. The object that they're storing is a card number. That's the identifi identification token. And the transaction details so they know what the customer bought so they can you know, throw up the right, the right ads when they come up to the website again the next time. There's really no constraints here because I don't care. I mean, I'm just saving this. I want anybody in my company to be able to see this. You know, who cares if they don't get a credit card number, right? And of course, the token here is the card number. So anybody see problems with this? Yeah. So finally we have the processor. They receive the authentication token. They verify the authorization with the customer's bank. They actually authenticate. So I said authentication token. That's wrong. I have to fix that. They, they receive the authorization token, and they verify it with the customer's bank. That is an authentication process. They're authenticating the authorization token. They transfer $149, and of course, they take their $3 cut, which is typical for a transaction that size, I'm told, and of course, pay Visa, because Visa's got to get their cut, too. So we're actually not going to talk about the processor today, because we're actually going to keep focusing on the merchant. So we have some gaps here. So the first gap, anybody see the first gap? It has to do with the, the constraints. So I think you're talking more about, so, the, so what you said was that the, the security of the card, once it, the merchant stores it, is insecure? Okay, yeah, that's, that's the second one. Yeah? So the constraints are just the one-time transactions and the information they have to allow them to make that transaction. Exactly. That is the first problem. The authentication, excuse me, the authorization token is not constrained either to a fixed amount or to a specific transaction. We've actually violated those constraints. The customer only intended for this card number to be used this one time for this one amount, and that is not what they actually passed. It's not their fault, 
but that means that token is valuable to theft. So if you have all the authorization information you need for a credit card transaction, that means as long as you possess that, you can make a transaction with any merchant anywhere in the world and probably get money out of it quite easily. So hence the value of credit card numbers on the black market. The second thing we also heard, which is that the identification token contains authorization data. That's really what's happening here. So when I store the credit card number for marketing purposes, I have failed to properly, uh, I, I, it's a reuse or misuse of tokens, right? So I have an authorization token. Now I'm repurposing it as identification. Guess what? You're not allowed to do that because that, again, introduces vulnerabilities because that token, although it doesn't have all of the authorization data there, is still somewhat valuable and vulnerable to theft. And plus, as anybody who's dealt with credit card numbers knows, it's also something that your PCI auditor will, PCI auditor will go after right away. So. so how do we go about fixing it? Well, there's some interesting things to be said about that. The customer, they don't really care. I mean, the reality is that the misuse costs them nothing. I mean, by law, if it's a credit card, their, their limit is 50 bucks. And in most cases, it's zero dollars. Now, there's obviously some hassle involved here, but for the most part, they don't really care, and there's not much they can do anyway. So the processor, I'm not going to talk about what the solution they would want today, but basically what they would push for is a one-time use authorization token of some kind tied to a single transaction, so they don't have to worry about storing all of that authorization data in their systems. And the merchant has the most difficult question is, how do I actually properly constrain that authorization token and also use that as an identifier? So there's a number of payment security solutions out there on the market today. Most people call this tokenization. Again, just to confuse everybody, yet another way to talk about tokens. So basically how this work, it works, and, and I've looked at a few of them, they all work pretty much the same way. The merchant when they get the authorization information, they send it to the gateway. The gateway is either a third party provider or the processor. They take that information, they store it, and they send back a special number called a token that is not a credit card number, not valid as a credit card number, but identifies either that card for that one transaction or for multiple transactions. In some cases, the gateway actually gets the, gets the authorization info, the card info, directly from the customer, so the merchant never has to touch it. This actually reduces the merchant's risk even further. So we have either one-time use tokens or multi-use tokens, depending on what, how it works. So The idea is after you get the token, it's usable after that for all of the rest of the payment cycle, completing the settlement, and any disputes and all that sort of thing. So, so looking at those solutions, how do they fix our gaps? So the one-time tokens comes pretty close. Uh, it satisfies the constraints maybe. Yes, it is for one transaction only. Yes, it's between the customer and the merchant. Yes, maybe 149, not, not sure. Um, but it doesn't meet the merchant's need to store identity. Multi-use tokens. This partially satisfies the constraint, so really only satisfies one, which is between the customer and the merchant. And it does meet the merchant need to store the identification token, but still doesn't solve all the problems. And even with both of these, we still have gaps. In the first case, you know, the constraints aren't fully met, or maybe they are for one-time tokens. But even in that case, then we don't identify the customer. And we also have another problem where we're having, again, mixed-use to mixed tokens. We're using an authorization token for identification. Again, you shouldn't do that. So really today, at least as far as I know, there isn't a solution that meets all the requirements. So here's a possible solution that our model suggests. If we generate two tokens instead of one, we can actually fix this problem. So we have a one-time use of, of, excuse me, authorization token that's kept in our payment system. And we have a unique identification token generated at the same time. It's important that this identification token be not valid for payment and not reversible. So what we have is a number that uniquely identifies a credit card number that we can never change back. 
So we know that we're getting the authorization data saved and we're getting the identification that we want. This actually satisfies all of our constraints. It's one transaction only between the customer and the merchant. We're assuming it's implemented properly and it meets the need to store identification. So, behavioral security model. So what is it? Again, it's a people-centric method for describing security requirements or implementations. It removes the ambiguity we have with social groups and makes those unstated, unstated constraints explicit. And it really, what we're going after here is that we can build better systems because they behave as expected, fewer vulnerabilities, better security. So, future directions. Where are we going with this next? So, this is just enough to whet your appetite, hopefully. So, the next one to two months, hopefully, I'll be coming out with a white paper that describes this process in more detail. You can look at the, the website or, or follow me on Twitter for news on that. Um, I want to, as I, as I use this in practice, which I plan to do, expand and refine the catalog of the actors, uh, especially the security functions and the constraints, so that people have something to work with, a catalog that helps them do their jobs when they're sitting down with people getting security requirements. Training programs, eventually, if we get sophisticated enough, we can do that, train people on how this works. And finally, a UML-based modeling template. There is something out there called Secure UML that I plan to extend just with a little bit of, with a few tweaks and actually use if you want to do formal UML processing. So, future directions for behavioral information security. Uh, design principles, I'm working on that. A taxonomy of user behaviors. There's already work started on this. Jeff Stanton did that. He did three years of research. But the ultimate goal really is to develop a full practice with these principles in mind. So I'll throw up some, some resources, references on the screen. These will be in my slides. I'll post it to the site. Uh, there's actually a number of people talking about these types of things. And here's some talks that I've recently attended that actually talk about thinking about the person and using that to do better security. So I, uh, I want to mention this book also. Uh, this is uh, Jeff Stanton's book. Uh, it is the summation of three years of research. Uh, I would recommend it as reading, if for nothing else, to read um, actual interviews with people talking about their attitudes about security. So people who you probably don't normally talk to and probably wouldn't tell you these things to your face, talking about how they feel about security. This book is, uh, the study I think was done a few years ago, I think it was done in the 2000s, early 2000s, so it's a little out of data, but I don't think people's attitudes change that much. Uh, 